We hope our program today is a wake-up call for some listeners. Should Christians do yoga? Is yoga demonic? And what does the Bible say about yoga? If you've ever had questions about yoga from a Christian perspective, stay tuned. This is from Kim. The New Age movement is becoming so popular. Yes, it is, by the way. Especially yoga and meditation. Is it okay for Christians to practice these? It's okay for Christians to stretch their bodies and to meditate on God's law and on Jesus. So meditation itself is not wrong if you're focused on the God who is. And you can do physical exercise with your body, but you cannot partake in Eastern religions. For our God is a jealous God, and we are not to have any other gods before Him or even with Him. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. This is Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. Jan's guest this hour had a paranormal encounter with a psychic relative. That event convinced Jessica of a spiritual reality outside the bounds of her Christian upbringing. As the mysterious realm of energies and meditation opened before her, she expanded her practice by seeking in-depth training at a Buddhist center in California, a meditation retreat in South America, and an ashram in India. After a decade of passionately pursuing spirituality, she became a certified yoga teacher and a master level Reiki practitioner. Jessica has a story to tell that we think all Christians who practice yoga or Reiki need to hear. Jessica has also written a book about her experiences titled The Shattering, An Encounter with Truth. So let's get started with Jessica Smith. Here is Jan Markell. Welcome to the program, and let me clarify right up front here that the previously announced programming for today had to be rescheduled due to the current health situation in America and the world. Gary Call will join me just as soon as possible, thus I had to insert best of programming today, a previously aired favorite on how the East is seducing the West, and particularly the Western Church. This originally aired in October of 2018. I'd like to set the stage, I think, and I'm going to do so by just talking about my rather special guest here by saying that she actually was raised in a at least by one parent who loved the Lord. Jessica actually left her beliefs in God behind. Why? Because she was going to go off. She was going to study things like yoga, Reiki. She was going to go to an ashram in India, live in a Buddhist center in Berkeley, became a Reiki master, and she was going to renounce anything that she knew about righteousness. Jessica writes in her book, I'm quoting, I spent my 20s traveling the world and exploring the spiritual realm of meditative practices in an effort to find real truth and peace. My ultimate goal was a good one, to make the world a better place by sharing what I learned along the way. She says, like many on this path, I thought the Bible was ridiculous and Christians were arrogant bigots. It got to the point that I cringed at the name of Jesus. So irritated was I by his followers and I grew to use his name solely as a swear word. Never would I have used Buddha's name as a curse word. Now, I happened to uh, get a hold of Jessica's book, and it's titled The Shattering, An Encounter with Truth. I'm going to give you some contact information and how you can order it just a little bit later. Jessica, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me, Chan. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Now, let me just get a little bit of background from you because as a child, you actually heard some truth in your home, but you chose a different path. You chose to go down a mystical path. You were going to eventually find out that this pathway you went down was not only dangerous, it was going to be almost deadly. Let me say you went from knowing the truth to saying, if you had handed me this book, meaning the book you wrote, I would have stopped reading it the first time Jesus' name was ever mentioned. So is there some particular experience that happened that sort of turned you in such a direction and so hardened your heart? 
Well, yes, absolutely. I grew up, Jan, like you mentioned, my mom was a Christian. She always taught us that Jesus was God, and I, and I believed that all growing up. Um, I had given my heart to Jesus as a child, and I went to church, and I loved to pray to Jesus. And as I got older, and popularity really is what it boiled down sure. to, became more important to me. I wanted to feel cool, and everything that comes along with that, partying at first, you know, I was always just the token Christian, thought that I could reach these people. People, you know, there are no other Christians around, but over time, of course, tended to have more of an influence on me than, than I certainly had on them. And um, so I slippery sloped yes. away, and I grew to the point where I wasn't going to church anymore. I was just downright had a rebellious heart, and Satan used that. He looked for his opportunity, and he, uh, he had it when a good friend of mine was killed in a motorcycle accident, and it really made me face, okay, what do I believe now? Do I still believe the Bible? And I didn't know anymore. I didn't know if, if I believed that that was true because I knew that that meant that there was a chance that my friend could be in a place called hell because I didn't know what her relationship with Jesus was like. We'd never talked about it. So I was just completely unwilling to accept that as a possibility because my friend had been this beautiful inside and out, just sweet, mm. sweet girl. And I was just unwilling to accept that there was a chance that a loving God could allow somebody like that to go to a place called hell. So I was just a wreck for, for a few days. I just cried and prayed, you know, what is truth? And and I had this overwhelming feeling to call a relative of mine. And this was strange because I wasn't close with this relative at the time. And it was persistent, just call this relative. And so I, I ended up calling. And I just started crying on the phone. It was kind of weird what I just said. I don't even know why I'm calling you. I just My, my friend just died, and I just want to know where she is. Unbeknownst to me, my, my relative was involved in mediumship and psychic abilities and whatnot and immediately asked me what my friend's name was and, and I told them and they proceeded to say, your friend is here with me now, what do you want to ask her? And the moment my relative started talking, this physical energy felt like a physical energy because I felt it physically, shot through the bottom of my feet and just just felt like this waves of euphoria, like peace and love. It was so hard to explain in words, but it's the best way I can explain it. Just like peace and love is what it felt like just shooting through my body in waves. And I thought, I've been praying to God for answers, and I know God is love. This must be God. Mm. Even though I knew what the Bible taught about it, I knew that the Bible strictly forbids mediums and do not practice divination and sorcery and do not seek out spiritists, all those things. I knew what the Bible said, but I had a choice at that moment. I could choose my feelings felt like peace and it felt like love and it felt like truth, or I could choose to believe what I knew the Bible to be saying. And at that moment, I chose feelings over what I knew the Bible said. I proceeded to have a conversation with who I believed was my friend who just passed away, mm -hmm. who gave me all sorts of details about how they had just died, which lined up with truth. And I thought, there's no way my relative could have possibly known this. This has to be truth. This has to be God. And all sorts of other details that were contradictory to the Bible about reincarnation and a whole slew mm -hmm. of other things. But all that to say, when I got off that phone, I was completely convinced that what I had just experienced was real truth, okay. that God, quote unquote, was now opening up this new realm of, of truth and possibility to me. And I wanted to learn how I could learn to communicate with spirit so I could, quote unquote, help people the way I felt I had just been helped. All right. Okay, Jessica, so this was going to open the door if I'm reading things right, to the supernatural, the new age, etc. Because I've read your book. And folks, the title of the book is The Shattering, The en Encounter with Truth. And really, it's a kind of a, it's her story, but it's also explaining some of the dangers of what she's talking about. We're going to spend a little extra time in this hour on yoga. And can a Christian engage in yoga? And Jessica was an instructor. She was a Reiki master. Also sorts of things. 
Obviously, she's been set free from all that. And let me just quote you in your book, Jessica Smith, and you say this, quote, and we're here, I'm, I'm in the realm here of yoga. You say, I felt there was a spiritual depth to yoga that was being lost in the westernized version presented in gym classes. I wanted to explore yoga's origins and learn about its spiritual foundations. Then I would be able to deepen my own practice and help preserve the tradition. I wanted to share the benefits I believed came from tapping to the root of the spiritual spiritual practice instead of just going through the poses for the sake of a workout. You say yoga also seemed to be an excellent tool in introducing people to the benefits of meditation, especially as it was becoming so popularized in Western nations. And then one more paragraph, I'm quoting you. You say, what better way to get a body-obsessed culture interested in a spiritual practice than to focus on its physical benefits. It was brilliant to repackage the ancient spiritual practice as a trendy body sculpting class at least people would attend, and it would open a crack into the spiritual world, drawing people who would otherwise reject Eastern spirituality. Okay, you are going to get drawn to India, am I right? Yes. Talk to me just a little bit about that experience going to India, the ashram. You met people who were teaching this practice. Talk to me about it. Well, yes, Janet. What I hadn't realized was that the actual gym yoga, the West, even the westernized version of yoga was setting into motion the spiritual. And what I mean by that is is even the poses Mm -hmm. set the spiritual into motion regardless of the people intend for it to or not. And we can talk a bit more about that here in a moment. But to answer your question, yes, I did go to India. I wanted to experience the depth of what yoga was. What was at the foundation of it? And um, so I knew that India was the place to go. It's where it originated. I knew I wasn't going to get some telephone game version of it. I was going to get uh, the actual roots. And, and that I certainly did. I learned a lot about the re- reality of what yoga is and what it is at its core and and what even is going on during a yoga class which a lot of people in our country even teachers don't have a clue what is being put into motion spiritually by the movements of yoga true did you learn then in india about this kundalini type experience sure so what kundalini is for those of you who've never heard of it is it's said to be awakened along a spiritual Mm -hmm. path. It's pagan and demonic to the core, but essentially what it is, it's an energy that um, is said to start at the base of the spine. It's kundalini is translated serpent, serpent energy, so demonic. It's said to, as one becomes quote unquote more awakened along their path, the kundalini is awakened through various methods, yoga being one of them. And the kundalini energy or spirit, demonic spirit, begins to uncoil and work its way from the base of the spine up to the crown of the head. And yes, while I was in India, one of the yoga classes was dedicated specifically to opening this kundalini. I had already done practices to open my own kundalini All right. years prior. Now, let me ask you this then. So you're very well aware of this kundalini effect. Do you think Let's bring it back to the Western world just for a moment here. Do you think those practicing it in the local gym, for that matter, and we'll get to this topic later, those practicing it in the church gym have any idea they're dealing with a kundalini spirit? No, because you're not going to be told that. You're not going to be told you're that. You're not going to be right. told that in your class. Of course, of course not. not. It's not. The point is to try to get people engaged uh, with the spiritual and, and And uh, listen, listen, Jan, listen to this quote by this uh, yoga guru. This might help explain it a little Mm -hmm. bit to our listeners. And many gurus will tell you this. Anybody who knows the depths of yoga, who knows what yoga actually is, such as gurus. Gurus are, it's another word for teacher. So this guru, Manju Patabi Joyce, his dad is the founder of this hugely popularized version of yoga that's in gym classes all over the place. Just a regular type of yoga that you'd see at gym classes. This is what he says. He's talking about 
about his dad who founded this type of yoga all over gym classes, all over the place. And this is what his dad says. This is his philosophy is. He says, the yoga asanas, which are the poses, so the yoga poses are important. You just do. Don't talk about the philosophy. 99% practice and 1% philosophy. That's what he taught. You just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Then slowly it, talking about the spiritual, talking about what you're talking about, will start opening up inside of you. So he's saying, you don't talk about it. You just practice. It's the practice alone the poses alone Mm -hmm. that will start slowly opening up the spiritual. This is not the Lord spiritual. This is not the Holy Spirit spiritual. We know as Christians that anything that is not the Lord is demonic spiritual. And that is clearly what this practice is. Yoga actually has its own set of doctrine that we can talk about in a little bit too, if you're, if you're interested, Jan, that just to, just to make it very clear what is at the root of yoga, just to establish that it is completely antithetical over and over and over again to biblical teaching. It's an ancient pagan practice, and that is what it is. You are answering my question, quite frankly. Sure. I had an answer to this question before this program. I've covered this topic on this program previously, but I wanted it to come from somebody like you and not somebody like me, a radio host, you, a former practitioner, promoter, etc. A Christian cannot be practicing yoga. Maybe I should say should not be practicing because they are, whether they're doing it unawares, whatever, they shouldn't be doing it. Absolutely not. Listen, guys, there's no way to separate out the spiritual aspect of it. There's no way. We just heard from a guru saying Mm -hmm. that the spiritual is activated just by doing the poses. Listen to this study, Jan, and then I want to talk a little bit more about Christians specifically doing yoga. But this study is fascinating. It's a secular study published in the Journal of Health Psychology, and it looked at why people start doing yoga and why they keep doing it. They were interested in why people do yoga. So here's what it found, and it's really fascinating and very telling. It said, to begin with, both students and teachers adopted yoga practice primarily for exercise Mm -hmm. and stress relief. So it's saying it's people start it for exercise and stress relief. Most people aren't interested. They don't get involved with yoga for the spiritual reasons. This is what the study found. Over 62% of students and 85% of teachers reported having changed their primary reason for practicing. What did it change to? For both, the top changed primary reason was spirituality. Finding suggests, and I'm quoting from the study here, finding suggests that most initiate yoga practice for exercise and stress relief, but for many, spirituality becomes their primary reason for maintaining practice. So that is fascinating, Jan, because we don't see that with running. We don't see it with golf or pole jumping or swimming or any other activity that's not spiritual to the core. Just like the guru said, these people just start it. They just keep doing it. And the spiritual opens up inside of them. They change their reason for doing it to spiritual. So I thought that was just fascinating to have scientific evidence showing that there is a spiritual foundation that's opening up that's doing something. My friend, uh, Carol Matriciana, and I'll play a clip from her just a little bit later in my second segment, but she made a film a number of years ago, probably 10 years ago, called Yoga Uncoiled from East to West. And she actually went about interviewing Christians because the setting of that film happened to be a church. Quite frankly, she came from California to a Minneapolis church and filmed the whole exercise going on in this particular church. It was a haunting film. We don't carry it any longer, and I'm not sure it's out there, but it opened my eyes, Jessica, and I'm talking to Jessica Smith for the hour because of her book, The Shattering, An Encounter with Truth. It opened my eyes to, I would have to say, the passion among some at least proclaiming Christians you know, I don't know their true heart, but they are proclaiming and professing Christians that they could worship Jesus through the poses and the stretching and the meditating the Eastern way. You can worship Jesus while you're doing these poses, while you're doing the stretching, and while you're meditating the Eastern way. I'm not talking about the West. They're talking about doing all of this the Eastern way and yet worshiping Jesus. It's absolutely impossible for for the exact 
purpose of yoga is to yoga means to yoke to yoke to unite. that's right yes and we're often told in our society that means to yoke together the body and the mind and the spirit that is not true the real definition of to yoke means to unite and the doctrine of yoga many don't understand if they've never heard that there's an actual doctrine of yoga that explicitly mm -hmm. tells us exactly what yoga is the doctrine of yoga tells us clearly that it's yoking with the pagan god it names the pagan god that the yoke is referring to in yoga the yoga sutras read as an outline for sorcery there is just point after point after point that is antithetical to the bible i could spend the rest of the hour right. showing you point by point well, they're anti completely <laughs> antithetical okay uh, we can pick up on this i just need to take a quick time out when i get back i'm going to play that little clip by carol matriciana from her film yoga uncoiled a very prominent filmmaker and was trying to teach the church on a lot of issues where they'd gone astray but one of her passions was to get them to understand. And Carol had been raised in India, okay? And she had seen all of this from childhood on up to age 20. And we'll open with that clip when I get back, folks. Don't go away. Coming right back. In 2016, over 36.7 million Americans practiced yoga, spending well over $16 billion on yoga products, such as mats and other accessories. So what is Christian yoga? Christian yoga is combining asana or the, the poses of yoga with a Christ-centered belief system. And it's very interesting to me how these two things work together. But why yoga over, say, running or swimming? Why is it my passion to do Christian yoga? So I always felt like there was something really unique to be said for just in general, getting stronger in your body while you're getting stronger in your spirit. When you're getting stronger in your body and your spirit at the same time, the result is we, we end up with a stronger mind. You don't carry as much self-doubt with you. And you're able to run after and be more on track with God's will and the things uh, fulfilling his purpose for your life. Author Jessica Smith is Jan's guest this hour. Jessica's conversation with Jan is informing you about yoga and the influence it's had in Christian circles. Let's return now to Jan Markell and Jessica Smith. By the 80s, the New Age Consciousness Movement, also known as the Human Potential Movement, although knowingly rooted in Eastern philosophy, had successfully marketed yoga practice and Eastern meditation to the West as scientifically proven and beneficial for health care and mental well-being. Today, yoga practice is offered in up to 80% of health clubs, promoted on TV as a body toner and flexibility exercises, and offered to corporate employees as medical benefits to steady the mind, calm the emotions, and relax away stresses. Once essentially recognized by the church as part of the Hindu religion, today yoga is being practiced by Christians and promoted in many forms of exercise as Christian mind-body fitness and as a spiritual vehicle able to enhance a richer Christian walk. How did India's Eastern mysticism gain access into the West in so short a time and appear to totally change its very heart and message? For some answers, we need only go back to the 1960s, the birth of the hippie generation, the psychedelic drug culture of hallucinogenic drugs, and the heroes of an era, the Beatles. And welcome back, and I'm continuing with my conversation with Jessica Smith. You can get her book, The Shattering. Here's a couple places, thetruthbehindyoga.com, thetruthbehindyoga.com, or do it the easy way, amazon.com as well. And I've read it cover to cover. I was traveling recently and, and had lots of time to uh, sit down and read it, and it's a fascinating all-true story because uh, she had a similar experience to mine in that she knew truth and she decided to, when she came to a crossroads, to make the wrong turn. And I did that for about a year in my life, so I know it can happen. And fortunately, God got a hold of both of us and turned us around in the right direction. Jessica, let's just go back here for a minute or two. We went out of that last segment with, is you can't do yoga for Jesus. You can't be 
praying to Jesus and worshiping Jesus at the same time you're doing some of these stretching and poses and positions. And I think you wanted to build on that for a moment. Go ahead. Absolutely. Well, there are two ways that people kind of approach their yoga class. One, I find people approach it as, well, it's just stretching. You know, everything that Jessica's talking about, that's not the type of yoga Mm -hmm. I do. I just do the stretching. I want to talk about why that can't be the case. Even your gym yoga class, no matter what type of yoga class you do, it is doing something. We touched on that a little bit, how I just talked about how it is opening up, it's activating the spiritual realm, but there are other things to consider too. So we want to touch on that. The other way that people approach yoga is I'll just plug Jesus into it and I'll do yoga for Jesus. I want to talk about why that is completely antithetical to the Bible and the Lord's heart too. And we'll talk about that. But in order to talk about both of those, I just think it's important to spend just a quick minute telling you about what the root of what yoga actually is. And I know it'll be tempting to say, not my type. Please keep in mind, yes, this is what's at the root of your gym yoga too. I mentioned that yoga has its own doctrine. Now, I want to talk about what the Bible has to say about it. The, basically, the yogic doctrine is an outline for sorcery, gives instructions on how to communicate with spirits. It has its own God that it names a pagan God in there. I don't get too much into this because the Bible warns in Deuteronomy 12:30 and Romans 16:19 not to dig into pagan teachings because they're they're intended to be a trap. So I just cover enough, and on my website as well, enough of the yogic doctrine to show you, to compare that it's completely antithetical to the Bible. And I give verses to show mm-hmm. you how it's antithetical. For example, in Leviticus 20:26, 20, clearly the Bible says, do not practice divination or sorcery, which the yoga doctrine outlines how to do that. In Leviticus 19:31, do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. In Deuteronomy 12:30, be careful not to be ensnared by inquiring about their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods? We will do the same. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way. With that verse right there, I want to go into yoga, plugging Jesus into yoga. Right here, the Lord's clearly saying, and I know this is Old Testament, but the same principles apply. There are many verses where the Lord all throughout the Old Testament says, do not adopt pagan practices. In fact, he says exactly the opposite over and over and over and over. He says, Deuteronomy 12, three to four, he says, break down their altars, smash their sacred stones and burn their Asherah poles in the fire, cut down the idols of their gods. There's no compromise here. He goes on to say, again, you must not worship the Lord your God in their way. The Lord wants us to come out to be separate, not to have anything to do with their practices. He doesn't say, just plug me in. That one's not so bad. You know, that one has some redeeming qualities. No, he says, don't worship me in your way. Repeatedly, do not worship the Lord in your way. Now, we've established, we've talked about the fact that it's doing something spiritually, whether you intend for it to or not. Now, we've also talked about the Bible says, don't worship the Lord your God in their way. So I'm going to say, even if you take all of that aside, Jan, if you take All of that aside where we know that it's doing something spiritual, we know at the foundation it's completely antithetical to the Bible, we know the Lord doesn't want us to worship him in their way, in pagan ways. So even knowing all that, we put all that aside, there's another aspect I want us to consider, and that is what we're saying to others. You know, the Lord tells us he wants us to be his ambassadors. We are. We are his ambassadors for him. And being an ambassador, it is our obligation to represent him well. Second Corinthians five eighteen to 20 tells us that we are his ambassadors. And, you know, when we put our stamp of approval on yoga by going to that class, that's telling people that this is an okay thing for Christians to do. Now, I want you to just think about what that's saying to people, because there might be somebody much like myself who is searching, you know, what is truth? And they think, oh, you know, this woman who I know is a strong Christian, she goes to yoga. That church even has yoga mm-hmm. classes. Surely there's, this is a path of truth. And, and they start digging in a little deeper, regardless of the fact that when they start doing it, that's leading them to a spiritual path. Even that aside, the fact 
that if they start digging into what you've put your stamp of approval on, they're going to find a path of divination and sorcery mm-hmm. and a God that is not the Lord. You know, 1 Corinthians ten twenty three to 24 says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No okay. one should seek their own good, but the good of others. So basically what I hear you saying is, um, you know, using pagan practices is not going to bring us closer to God. My producer here, you have someone that you care about a whole lot that you feel could fall in the category that yoga is not a harmful thing whatsoever. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I have many relatives, Jan, and friends that do and practice yoga, and they're very committed Christians. It's almost like a blind side Mm -hmm. to their understanding. And of course, we know that in our day, and you talk about it all the time, Jan, that we live in an era where discernment is dead. That's right. And, And in this case, discernment is dead. Jessica, I have a question for you. As I listen to you speak about this yoga, what is the difference between the spirit of yoga and the spirit of the Ouija board? Is there a difference? Well, no, Uh, and that might shock a lot of people (laughs) to say that, but the spirit of both is demonic. It's Satan, and that's a really good question because Actually, I can use the Ouija board as an, as an illustration to help people understand that, you know, yoga is activating the spiritual realm regardless of your intent, just like the Ouija mm-hmm. board does. So, for example, if you're not familiar with the Ouija board, it was packaged by Milton Bradley as a harmless board game for kids or the family. Many of us who know what it is know that it is not harmless. It has uh, letters on it and a little game piece and asks questions. And the spiritual realm interacts with the person, the practitioner who puts their hands there by spelling out an answer. It's completely demonic. It's the demonic energies that are activating the spiritual realm and communicating. Now, it's the same thing with yoga. The whole purpose of yoga, just like the whole purpose of the Ouija board, is to commune with the spiritual realm. Only instead of using the fingertips on the little plastic piece, one moves their body into the poses, and the poses activate the spiritual realm. The poses are actually, many of the poses are actually invocations to certain gods or demons that they represent. And by placing the fingers on the Ouija board game piece, it activates the spiritual realm the same way that moving the body into these poses activates the spiritual realm. Now, interesting about this is that it doesn't matter if you believe in the Ouija board or not. If if you Mm -hmm. put your finger tips on it, you can think this is stupid, nothing is going to work. And you know, sometimes nothing nothing may work, but sometimes it, it's going to work. Well, and you don't have any control over that. I have to interject here, Jessica, simply because you're bringing up a topic here. This is what led me astray in my 20s, uh, was a Ouija board and the power behind a Ouija board. And folks, what we're talking about, let me just go back to discernment is dead. Discernment is not only dead, but discernment can be deadly if you lose it. And the Ouija board could have been deadly to me because I lost all discernment and started monkeying with it. As a Christian, and so you certainly can be a believer and and take a path down, sometimes temporarily. I don't know if people can do it forever, but in my case, it was for just a year that I was really heavily addicted to the supernatural. And that Ouija board, I asked where it's got its power, and it's spelled S-A-T-A-N pretty quickly. And I put a little tiny New Testament on that board, and that plastic little object knocked that New Testament off the Ouija board and began spinning around in circles because it was outraged that I had introduced the Word of God on a tool of the devil. So all we're saying here, folks, is be careful. And if, in fact, you think that as a believer, you can be participating in some of these things, you can be doing the poses, and you're just stretching, you're just exercising, it's healthful, and you're trying to lead a more healthy life. We're sending out the warnings this hour that you may think you're doing great physical good to your body, but in the process, you're doing huge spiritual damage. Would I be accurate there, Jessica? 
Absolutely. Yes, I would I would absolutely warn everyone. There are so many things to do instead of yoga. And I've heard people say, well, it's the only thing that helps my back, or I feel so peaceful from it. And listen, guys, Satan is going to let you feel peaceful from it. He's going to let your back feel better from it because he doesn't care about your body. He cares about your soul. And It's your soul that is being affected here. And there are many things to do instead of doing yoga. And I would ask, what is your intent? If if it's for physical purposes, you know, walking and stretching and moving, that's why people say yoga is good for them because you're moving. That's, That's what's important is stretching and moving and toning. So I would point to just regular stretching if you need assistance in that, maybe even just ordering a book on proper stretching and, and working on that, going for a walk and talking to the Lord during your walk. If it's mm-hmm. for anxiety or stress relief, I would recommend highly get up an extra 10 minutes, even 20 minutes, a half an hour early and spend some time with the Lord and his word and praying in the morning and you will see wonders for anxiety and stress relief. Or even, like I mentioned, praying to him while you're walking, spending that time with the Lord and that is what will do wonders wonders for not only your body, but your soul as well. Well, Jessica, you know, sometimes people will say, well, we play Christian music while doing Mm -hmm. yoga. Well, okay. Does that sanctify the spirits that (laughs) yoga represents? Would, let me ask you something, would it sanctify doing the Ouija board if you had music that was Christian playing in the background? Absolutely not. But again, lack of discernment. Think, well, we're praying and praising God while we're doing it, so it must sanctify what we're doing. Right. Absolutely not. The Lord doesn't share his glory, and he doesn't want us to worship. He's not, Jesus isn't going to answer you in a Ouija board, and Jesus isn't going to answer you in a yoga class. Here's where you can get some more information, folks. Write it down. The Truth Behind Yoga.com. That's Jessica Smith's website. You can also get the book there, The Shattering and Encounter with Truth, or The Truth Behind Yoga.com. If you want to do it the easy, quick way, Amazon.com has the book as well. But her website has articles, has all sorts of interesting pointers, including scripture to refute the fact that you can sanctify what is ungodly. You can't, folks. And honestly, personal life and your spiritual life is going to get really complicated if you try doing it. I'm speaking from experience. Jessica's speaking from experience. I dabbled. Thank God I stopped with the dabbling. Jessica went much, much more deeply into all of this. Jessica, here's where I want to go in my closing segment. And if you have some more warnings for folks, that's fine. But I, I want to touch just a little bit on Reiki because at the same time, and you were over in India and you were also out in Berkeley and some other places, and you were getting very deep into Reiki. Now, Reiki today is seen very respectably. You and I know it's not a respectable practice, and yet it's everywhere. You can be trying to recover in a hospital, and and someone will come in and say, may I pray over you? And I know what they want to do. They want to do Reiki over me, and I won't let them. So I want to ask you a little bit about that. I'm coming back in just a minute or two, and we're going to wrap up my discussion. Again, the truth behind yoga.com. If you want to understand from a biblical perspective, look, that's the only position I try to present here. Uh, would be the issues from a biblical perspective. And Jessica Smith has that on her website. You can learn a lot more at the website or in the book, The Shattering. Back in a minute or two, don't go away. Within Hinduism, it's understood that divinity is in everything. God is in everything. Everything is divine, whether it's the rat on the street, the cow in the street, the monkeys in the trees, you, in fact, in, before every yoga class, you say namaste. That means in Hindi, the God within me bows to the God within you. So that is all an integral part of the spiritual discipline of yoga. And Brahman is understood to be a God consciousness, not a person. So when you say that you become God, it's a consciousness, it's a force, it's a thinking that you need to connect into. So in fact, you need to alter your worldview. Before we conclude today's program with author Jessica Smith, remember Jessica's book, The Shattering, An Encounter with Truth, can be found at Amazon.com. Once again, Jen Markell.
And it really boggles the mind to see how people will present something from one worldview into another culture and try to shift it and change it and alter it into being something it is not and cannot be. It's very fundamental to Buddhist and Hindu meditation is to follow the breath, to empty the mind, to uh, change consciousness, and to move consciousness away from logic, the relationship of objects, normal everyday awareness, to a supposedly higher level of consciousness. It's breathing, it's postures, it's words. There are relaxation techniques that are not yoga, but yoga in principle has this worldview behind it. So you really can't Christianize this. Because what you're doing is you're submitting yourself to an ancient spiritual discipline, the point of which is to transform your consciousness to connect with the sacred apart from a mediator. And welcome back. And I'm wrapping up an hour with Jessica Smith. And I hope you'll look into some of the things she's offering, starting with her website, thetruthbehindyoga.com. She was very much into the whole yoga experience. Let me just quickly say this program is posted to my website every Saturday morning. Perhaps you'd like to just uh, download the app at oneplace.com. Use their mobile app and it'll be downloaded to your devices Saturday morning. And uh, I want you to look into my e-newsletter and my print newsletter. And if you do write to us, would you always tell us what station you're listening to? By the way, we're very active on social media. If you check out Jan Markell's Olive Tree Ministries at Facebook and Olive Tree Men at Twitter, we're also on Instagram. I want to get back because the time is winding down, spending it with Jessica Smith. Jessica, you wanted to say a word or two, kind of wrap up your thoughts on the issue of stretching. Yes, just I know there will be some questions when I mention stretching. What about if the stretch it looks like a yoga pose? Can I, can I still do it? Now, here's the point I want to make about that. With a Ouija board, there is nothing wrong with the letters on the Ouija board. We use them in words all the time. Nothing wrong with them. The same way there's nothing wrong with stretches. Satan doesn't get to claim letters, and he doesn't get to claim stretches. What is important is the context in which they're being used. Don't use it in the context of the Ouija board. Don't use the stretches in the context of a yoga class. There's nothing wrong with stretching up to the sky. And I've been searching for uh, an alternative that I can recommend to people, but so far I haven't been able to find anything. So I do have plans of starting my own alternative called okay. True Tone Fitness. If you're interested in that, feel free to um, contact me on my website to get on a, an email list and I'll let you know when that's ready. But I do want to let you know that you're absolutely fine stretching and toning. Just don't do it in the context of the class. We were talking uh, just a little bit off air and you were citing some illustrations rather of folks who got involved in some of this, let's just say the paranormal activity, the new age type philosophy, and lo and behold, lo and behold, their lives really started to go over a cliff. And you would substantiate that, correct? And you'd know many illustrations of that. Oh, absolutely. I've heard time after time after time, I've heard people and seen it firsthand of lives that just start falling apart in one way or another, be it um, relationships falling apart. That tends to be a huge one. Just things start going chaotic. I've seen many people experiencing, that used to be strong marriages, divorce strong people, strong relationships out of, out of nowhere. And the thing that's tricky is that people don't recognize that this is where it's coming from, but there's this common denominator. Yes. Just like me, I didn't recognize this is where it was coming from. There's no way I would have recognized that my life was falling apart as a result of these practices that felt like they were bringing me peace and clarity and love, but that's where it was all stemming from. If your relationship is falling apart, if you're doing this, or if it's a sickness or an illness, or if it's right. a number of other things, that you're not even associating with this. And if you're not now, or maybe it's just that your relationship with the Lord isn't as close as it used to be. And I guarantee you, this is putting a wedge in yeah. that. So this well, whole purpose is to take you away from the Lord. It's opening a door. It's opening a door. Yes. And, and the enemy will come in and seize this opportunity by your yes. opening that door. I'm just going to transition here for a few minutes. And you also, because of your experience at the ashram in India, other places as well, you you got into this energy healing. It's also known as Reiki. And I don't want to let the hour go by without hitting on it. It's in the same category. It's 
in the same family. It's the same type of supernatural that is of a demonic source, though today, and I'm hearing about it more and more. I get emails. I hear actually actual testimonials that you can sanctify Reiki, that the energy, that energy healing that comes through Reiki is of God sanctified of God. You and I know that isn't true, and I'm not sure how we convince a skeptical person that it isn't true. Talk to me a little bit because you were a Reiki master. We can easily convince you that it's not true by looking at what Reiki is and then looking at the Bible and seeing if they're in alignment, and it's very easy to see that they are not. Reiki is a spiritual act. This is not just my experience of it. Even I was a Reiki master. There's three levels of, of Reiki training. Uh, you go through different attunements, they're called, where the transference of Reiki energies, which is spiritual energy, is transferred from one practitioner to the other. I'm going to read you a little bit, Jan, right off of Reiki.org because I know people's tendency. If I just tell you guys what it is, there's going to be people to say, that's just her experience. Ours wasn't like that. Ours was a different kind of energy. But I'm going to just give you some information off of Reiki.org because there's no arguing with that. This is what Reiki is. It says, Ray is also called God and has many other names depending on the culture that has named it. Now, I know the temptation for a lot of people is going to be to say, this is where what you were talking about, Jim, where the sanctified Reiki comes in. Well, we can just plug Jesus into it. Correct. And he is the non-physical energy, it says. So That's the spiritual right. energy, energy that animates all living things. So people will say, well, we can put that together. We'll plug Jesus into it because it's just God. It has many other names. Well, there's an easy way that we can check if we can do that or not. Let's look and see what Reiki is and see if it's in alignment with the Bible. Because if we can do that, then it will be in alignment with the Bible. Here on another page of Reiki.org, here's what it says. Listen carefully. Let's see if it's in alignment with biblical scripture or not. The Reiki attunement, which is the training in which the energy is passed from one to another, the teacher from the student, the Reiki attunement is a powerful spiritual experience. The attunement energies are channeled into the student through the Reiki master. The process is guided by the Rei, or God consciousness. Now, this is a name of a pagan god, mm -hmm. Ray, and makes adjustments. But even if you want to say it's not and plug Jesus in, just wait, there's more, and makes adjustments in the process depending on the needs of, of each student. The attunement is also attended, red flag, here it comes, by Reiki guides and other spiritual beings who help implement the process. Many report having mystical experiences involving personal messages, healings, visions, and past life experiences. Students often report experience involving opening the third eye, increased yes. intuitive awareness, and other psychic abilities after receiving a Reiki attunement. You mentioned the third eye there, and, and when I hear things about the third eye, I associate it with the whole New Age movement, which is really mm -hmm. where we're at right now. I mean, it's the invasion of all things New Age metaphysical, which I never thought I'd live to see the day that it would invade the church, but it has invaded the church, which is why I'm doing this hour, and which is why, folks, I've given an hour to Jessica Smith, is because it's not just yoga. It's the whole metaphysical. It's the entire, mm -hmm. it's the entire world invading the church, but in this case, more specifically, it's invading the church through making things that are very demonic look very innocent, naive, simple, healthy, isn't it good for our body and mind? Clearly, there were many things in, in this teaching and this practice that are antithetical to the Bible. It mentioned psychic's abilities. We've already established, we, I, we talked about verses that psychic and mediumship and communicating with spirits is completely against the Bible. So there's no way that Jesus can be plugged into this because it's a pagan practice that is a, against what the Bible teaches. Same thing with yoga. You can't plug it in. You can't plug Jesus into it. And that's the same thing with all. All of these new age practices, yoga, mindfulness meditation yes. is another one that is huge. We're going to do school. we're going to do a program on that down the road. Somewhat is mindfulness because I'm getting lots of emails about it. Oh, wonderful! Yes, and it's not just in doctors' offices. It's you know, it's in your gyms. It's in your it's in magazines. It's in your churches even. And I would just encourage if you are a pastor of a church or a leader of a church or if you attend a church, encourage your pastor to to look into these things and not to allow them at your 
church and show them the reasons why. Feel free to use my website as a resource because it goes back to the Bible. And that's what we want to go back to, guys. Not the way that we feel when we do something, not the way that the society is portraying it or presenting it, not if your doctor tells you to do it or the magazine or the talk show host, guys. What does God have to say about it? That's what we care about. And he's very clear. So I encourage you all to look into it and seek the Lord on this, and he will tell you his truth regarding all of these issues. The book is The Shattering, An Encounter with Truth, Jessica Smith, and her website again. You might want to visit the website and sign up for the, well, what she hopes she'll come along with here, a kind of a substitute for some of the things we're talking about that actually would be righteous and more holy than what we've talked about. The Truth Behind Yoga dot com. The Truth Behind Yoga dot com. Just a 2020 conference heads up here. The leadership at Olive Tree Ministries is taking sort of a wait and see position concerning our September 26th, 27th conference. Tickets were to go on sale June 1st. That date will likely be pushed to later in the summer. Could the event be canceled? Well, hard to say here in March. Let's pray that God turns all of this around by fall. We'll make further conference announcements on air, online, and in our various newsletters. We would advise you not to make plane reservations, etc. right now until we see where the corona crisis is going by midsummer. In that I'm totally out of time, let me just wrap this hour up by saying this, that the Bible says in Ephesians 5 that those days were evil. So imagine how evil is waxing worse and worse today as predicted in 2 Timothy 3. We are called to be salt and light and to push back against the evil of our day. We are also to occupy until he comes to win the lost while there is time and always to look up knowing that he is coming soon. Say, I want to thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week. Lord of the ages, God before time, we are a vapor, you are eternal. Love everlasting, reigning on high. Thank you for joining us for today's Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. We continue to report current events from a biblical perspective. Across America and the World Wide Web, this broadcast comes to you every weekend at no cost. It cost us thousands of dollars. To help us produce and distribute this weekly media outreach, would you consider standing with us? This is an ever-changing world. Men and women of faith need to be aware of current events viewed through the lens of Scripture. Each week, Jan Markell brings you a compelling program to point out hidden dangers in today's culture and to bring hope through faith in Jesus Christ. We're inviting you to join us in this listener-supported ministry. To become our financial partner, please write with your tax-deductible gifts to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Contributions are welcome at olivetreeviews.org or when you phone 763-559. 4444. For around the clock global updates with a biblical worldview, visit olivetreeviews.org. We look forward to hearing from you this week. Thank you for praying for Jan and her media team. Next week, Jan Markell returns with another information and inspiration packed hour, all designed to help you understand the times. Oh.